Hello and welcome to Nursing News You Can Use with Baxter Professional Services and the Nurse Shark Academy. I'm very excited to be here. We have some great things that are happening and we'll go over that um, with you in the upcoming uh, show notes. So let's get started with our affirmations for today, February the 1st, 2023. First off, I'd like to say happy Black History Month to all of our um, nurses out there and to all um, out there happy Black History Month. So let's get started. All right. So our first affirmation, and this is again from our new affirmation calendar, inspirational daily calendar, um, available on Amazon. You can pick that up at any time. It says, don't let small minds convince you that your dreams are too big. I'm going to say that again. Don't let small minds convince you that your dreams are too big. Our second affirmation, difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. Difficult roads often lead to beautiful destinations. And our third um, affirmation for today, don't spend time beating on a wall, hoping it will transform into a door. Don't spend time beating on a wall, hoping it will transform into a door. And, into a door and that was credited to Coco Chanel. So I just wanted to share those affirmations with you and go ahead and get into it because we have a lot of news to cover. All right, so again, it's Black History Month and what I like to do every year during Black History Month is to celebrate um, some things about uh, the nurses that we have out there. So uh, first things first, I do want to tell you a little bit about the history of Black History Month as we kick off for today. Um, Black History Month is observed each year from February the 1st through March the 1st to recognize the generations of Black and African Americans who struggled with adversity and to celebrate their many contributions to the United States. This is coming from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, by the way. Uh, this Black History Month, the HHS Office of Minority Health is highlighting the roles of food insecurity and nutrition have on common health disparities faced by Black and African American communities, such as an increased risk of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and maternal and infant mortality. Uh, some of the information that they have put out here, um, it says uh, Black and African Americans are the second largest minority population in the United States following Hispanic and Latino populations. Um, in 2021, nearly 20% 20 of Black and African American households experience food insecurity. And the United States, 18.3% of Black and African American adults over the age of 18 are in fair or poor health. And that food insecurity has been linked to increased risk of cardiovascular disease and obesity. And obesity is a key factor in the higher rates of diabetes seen in Black and African American communities. So I wanted to share that information with you because obviously we're all about health care here. Um, and just a little bit about the history of Black uh, History Month. Um, in 1926, American historian Carter G. Woodson established Black History Week in February to commemorate and celebrate the contributions to the United States made by Black and African Americans. In 1976, the observance became a month-long celebration and was proclaimed by United States President as National Black History Month. And so uh, just to let you know that, that a little brief history of that. Okay. All right. So let's let's get into our, um, our leadership moment. And usually in our leadership moment, I do the um, what I'm reading segment. But in lieu of that, what I wanted to do was a highlight um, some nurses throughout the year, some African American Black nurses. And so let's do this. Um, Oh, this is last week's. Hold on. Let me get to this week's articles. There we go. All right. So here we are. This is coming from uh, Chamberlain University. And they put this on their website. And so I thus, thought I'd share some of this with you. And so each week during Black History Month, we're going to celebrate some of these Black nurses uh, that are here. So let's start with... Um, Mary Seacole, uh, born in 1805, died in 1881. Um, she was a British Jamaican nurse and businesswoman who set up the 
British hotel to care for soldiers during the Crimean War. So according to the website, and I'm going to read what it says, it says, while Florence Nightingale rose to international prominence following her time nursing soldiers during the Crimean War, another heroic nurse was on the front lines of the conflict, mixed race nurse Mary Seacole. Seacole traveled the world extensively, nursing cholera patients during an outbreak in Panama before seeking a nursing position in Crimea for which she was rejected. Undeterred, she established a British hotel which catered to sick and recovering soldiers. She visited battlefields to tend to the wounded and was referred to warmly by soldiers as Mother Seacole. In 2004, more than 10,000 people voted for Mary as the greatest Black Britain and a statue of the famous nurse was unveiled in London in 2016. So um, our next uh, nurse is Harriet Tubman, uh, born 1822, died 1913. Uh, we know Harriet Tubman as the uh, conductor on the Underground Railroad, but she also acted as a nurse during the Civil War, tending to black soldiers and liberated slaves. Um, so in addition to caring for the people she rescued from slavery, excuse me, she served as a nurse for the Union Army, traveling to South Carolina to tend to the sick and wounded black soldiers and those newly liber liberated from enslavement. This passion for care continued on after the war when she established a Harriet Tubman home for aged and indigent Negroes in 1908, where she cared for its residents until her death in 1913. So there's more to know about some of these nurses and uh, that we may not have known. So let's move on to uh, Mary Eliza Mahoney, born 1845, died 1926. Uh, Mary Eliza Mahoney has the distinction of being the first black nurse in history as she was the first to earn an a professional nursing license in the United States and the first to graduate from an American nursing school. Born to freed slaves, she worked as a janitor, cook, washerwoman, and a nurse's aide over the course of 15 years at the New England Hospital for Women and Children, according to the National Women's History Museum. At the age of 33, she entered the hospital's nursing program and graduated 16 months later. As the first black nurse in history, she championed increased access to nursing education and fought against discrimination in the profession throughout her career, supporting the creation of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses in 1908. Then we have uh, Ada Bell Toms, 1870 to 1943. In 1906, Ada Bell Toms was named Assistant Superintendent of Nurses at Lincoln Hospital in New York. While she would spend the next 18 years acting as director, her race precluded her from being given the title, according to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Toms co-founded the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses and served as the organization's president from 1916 to 1923 and later successfully lobbied for Black nurses to serve in the American Red Cross Nursing and Army Nurse Corps during World War, II, World War I. Toms published the first chronicle of the history of Black nurses in America with her book, Pathfinders, A History of the Progress of Colored Graduate Nurses. She was one of the original inductees to the American Nurses Association Hall of Fame in 1976. So that's our four uh, Black nurses for Black History Month. I'm very happy to be able to share that with you and the information that they have. So there'll be more for that. But if you want to read up more, uh, please get on the website uh, from Chamberlain uh, University and you can certainly see that as well. All right, let's move on to the news segment. And I'm pretty sure you've probably heard this, but Let's get on with it because it's been big in the nursing field and the nursing profession. So this is a New York Times article that came out uh, last week. And when I saw it, it, it shocked me. And if those of you who follow me on other media know that I've talked about this before, but I wanted to bring this out here because since 
reading this article, I've done some additional um, research, which we'll be talking about. I'm going to be coming out in our newsletter today. Uh, some additional research that I did on this very topic. Uh, but this New York Times article says 7,600 fake nursing diplomas were sold in a scheme, U.S. says. Uh, so more than two dozen people have been charged in connection with a scheme in which fake nursing diplomas were sold to buyers who then used the credentials to obtain nursing licenses and jobs and healthcare settings across the country, according to federal prosecutors. The scheme involved the sale of more than 7,600 fake diplomas issued by three South Florida nursing schools, which have since been closed. Siena College and Sacred Heart International Institute, both in Broward County, and Palm Beach School of Nursing in Palm Beach County, prosecutors said. The 25 people charged this week include administrators of the Florida schools and administrators and affiliates of a series of nursing test prep academies and other states that recruited candidates to buy fake diplomas, said Omar Perez Abar, special agent in charge for the Miami region of the Office of Inspector General at the Department of Health and Human Services. So they termed this Operation Nightingale. And they said that the buyers paid between $10,000 and $15,000 to obtain the bogus diplomas and transcripts indicating that they earned legitimate degrees like the associate degree in nursing. That degree can take up to two years to complete. So the diplomas and transcripts were then allowed them to qualify for the National Nursing Board exam or the NCLEX. About 37% of those who bought the freight documents or about 2,800 people passed the exam. So what they did is uh, it sounds like they went to these uh, fake schools, got these fake diplomas, and then went to these testing places that prep you to take the exam and so what they would teach them is how to take the test over and over again so i want to point out that these people never went to clinical never set foot in the classroom in a lot of cases um so uh, there's, it says that there's a significant number that receive nursing licenses and secure jobs in hospitals and other healthcare settings and we're going to talk about some of those because when i was looking at this the story more came out. So I'm going to suggest that you take a look at this uh, New York Times article because you don't have time to read the whole article because there's so much more to get into. But um, so that brings us to our next article because um, some of the people knew about it, but not everybody knew that they were in this, this issue. So um, yeah, so here's another one. Um, I found interesting. Okay, so let's get to this one. Um, this is what happened in uh, Vero Beach, Florida, according to the TC Palm. And it says there's a woman there her, who went by the name of Michelle Renee w Rimes, or Wimes, um, who also went by the name of um, Michelle Hudson. Uh, she allegedly ran a school called, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank here, uh, the name of the school in Vero uh, Beach, Vero Beach, uh, Florida, uh, was uh, named, um, why can't I, why can't I find this? Okay. Oh, Grace Medical Training. That's it. Yes, Grace Medical Training. Um, and so according to the article, I apologize, according to the article, um, she collected more than $93,000 in tuition from these students. And what the uh, prosecutors found is that Wimes um, is not certified to teach. And uh, according to River, she said she trusts the women's dreams of being a nurse. Some got jobs based on the fake certificates and therefore lost their jobs after it was determined that their certificate was no good. Um, according to this, um, she defrauded 37 people who paid tuition in the scheme. Um, some of these students had planned on graduation and gotten their families involved. Um, one of the students said um, she entered the school because a colleague was going to the school. So she also became uh, into the school and that she says, um, when she got into the school, um, that she was, didn't know about the school's accreditation. 
Once she started taking classes and reviewing the material, she found it subpar and that competent nurses would not be produced there. Um, uh, this a person, uh, Nelson, says, um, I realized what she was doing was wrong. I was so upset over this. And so she paid, uh, Roseanne uh, Nelson paid uh, $5,300 for her classes only to find out that it wasn't accredited. Um, so they're asking the students to reach out to the Commission for Independent Education, um, and they're working with the Board of Nursing regarding Grace Medical Training. Um, and so I want to stop here and say, as a person who was attempting to start a nursing school in the state of Indiana, um, it's very hard to find good clinical sites for uh, these students to go to. And so there is a shortage of available places for people to go and get their training completed. I'm saying this to say, um, not that I'm a, a excusing anything that was done here in this case uh, from this fraud, but I'm saying that it makes it harder then for legitimate programs to um, operate because you have instances like this. Uh, which brings us to our other story um, here in, again in Florida. And according to this article by nurse.org, four students from HCI College in Florida have filed a federal court lawsuit against the school on December 2nd. Um, the students claim the school conducted a malicious scheme intended to block 95% of the students from graduating and taking the NCLEX. They also claim the school purposely misrepresented its accreditation status and NCLEX pass rate. So HCI College, formerly known as Health Career Institute, has two locations in Florida, Fort Lauderdale and West Palm Beach. The college offers an associate degree program in nursing as well as programs in medical assisting, veterinary assisting and emergency medical services. According to their website, HCI is accredited by the Accrediting uh, Commission of Career Schools and Colleges. Accreditation for the nursing program is not listed and that their nurse uh, NCLEX pass rate since inception has been 46 percent, uh, 46.1 percent to be exact. Now, this this is important because if they don't have a good pass rate, they're not going to be accredited by the nursing accreditation process. So the filing accuses HCI of committing a series of scams in order to mislead students and ultimately prevent them from graduating and taking the NCLEX. The suit claims that HCI College misrepresented its accreditation status and lied about its NCLEX pass rate. It also says that the school deliberately attempted to prevent students from graduating and not taking the NCLEX by unfairly dropping them from the program or forcing them to pay to retake classes that HCI argued were non-transferable. So um, this, again, there's issues in it. I don't know what's going on um, in Florida, but there's also specific things that happen uh, with this school in that uh, there, they had a clinical relationship with Cleveland Clinic Medical Center in Weston, Florida, and it was terminated in 2021 by the Cleveland Clinic because they didn't have the appropriate accreditation. Uh, and so once they couldn't go, the students had to go to study hall sessions to complete the required clinical hours. Um, somewhere between May of 2021, HCI adopted a new grading policy as a way of weeding out students and forcing them to retake semesters they had already paid for. Um, some students were forcibly expelled for not passing the new high stakes testing requirements. We're told that they are being removed from the student body on the basis of academic integrity. In the fall of 2021, only five students out of a class of over 100 passed the new final exam and were permitted to graduate. According to the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, only eight students who graduated in December 2021 went on to take the NCLEX RN in the first quarter of 2022. So um, apparently HCI has a history of unethical conduct in 2018 and 2019. The college was put on probation by the Florida Board of Nursing for having NCLEX pass rates below the state standards for nursing programs, which is when they failed to uh, get accreditation for the ACN program. 
So the program was was terminated by the Florida Board of Nursing in August 2019. Rather than attempting to approve the program and apply for reinstatement, the school simply created a new program and obtained a different state identification number. So this is what happens. These schools close down and then they get a new uh, name, new number, and they operate in the same way. And so, again, this is something that is happening. I wanted to bring this out because this is causing massive disruption um, in our profession. And which brings us to this case and brings us back to the case in Florida um, of the people that were arrested. An Iowa man worked for four years as a nurse after buying a fraudulent diploma. So this is coming from the Iowa Capital Dispatch. Um, it says a central Iowa man worked as a state licensed nurse for four years after purchasing a fraudulent nursing degree from an alleged diploma mill, according to state regulators. In January of 2018, Inomi Masango of West Des Moines filed an application with the Iowa Board of Nursing seeking license as an LPN or licensed practical nurse. At the time, he reported having attended a 17-month practical nursing program at the National School of Nursing and Allied Health in Virginia. Um, the board approved his application and he was issued an LPN license in 2018. In June of 2020, he filed another application with the board, this time seeking a registered nurse's license. And according to state records, he reported that he graduated from Florida's Siena College of Health in June of 2019. This is the same um, college in Florida, one of them that got busted by the feds. Um, he submitted a copy of his diploma and a transcript showing attendance at the school over a period of 15 months. So one year later, after he completed the NCLEX in Iowa, he received his RN license. Six weeks after receiving his license, uh, the National um, Organization for State Nursing Boards notified Iowa the Iowa Board of the FBI investigation into the nursing education programs that were suspected of selling fake diplomas and transcripts. The suspects in the case included the National School of Nursing and Allied Health and Siena College of Health. So by the time the Iowa Board was notified, the states of Virginia and Florida had long since ordered the two institutions to cease operations. Uh, when interviewed, uh, the gentleman said that he wanted to take a shortcut to completing his nursing education. And so after the hearing, the board concluded that Masango had engaged in fraud when he knowingly purchased fraudulent documents in order to qualify for licensure in Iowa. Um, Masango, the board said, received little to no classroom instruction and did not undergo any clinical training. The board has recently revoked both its LPN and RN licenses. There is a criminal case still pending with no trial date set. Um, and so this is some of those informations that we need to, to know. So you're going to be seeing more and more of this come to light. All right, so let's take a look at this article. And again, this is Florida, not bashing Florida, but this is where a lot of this is coming out of. And this came from the Tampa Bay Times. And it says, pass rates continue to fall at Florida nursing school data shows. So it's a tough time to be in Florida if you want to be a nurse. Okay, so nursing, uh, it says... that the National Council of Licensure, the NCLEX, is the final step for graduates to become licensed healthcare providers in a state that is desperate for nurses. Um, nursing staffs at Florida hospitals have estimated they're short about 60,000 nurses by the year of 2035. But Florida has had the lowest exam pass rate in the nation since 2017. Pass rates for registered nurses fell by 1% point a percentage point from 2021, dropping to 63.9%. That's far below the national average pass rate of 79.9% for first time US educated test takers. The rate for practical nurses who are permitted to perform more limited healthcare duties was 65.6%, .6 up three percentage points from 2021. 
but below the first time U.S. educated practical nurses pass rate of 79.9%. So again, there's this issue of not having uh, nurses be able to pass their NCLEX in Florida. And part of this may also be because of this fraudulent activity. And it's interesting enough, it says nurses licensed in New York are also licensed to practice in Florida and many other states. Uh, so going back to the fake uh, degrees, it says those who purchase a fake degree may lose their certification of practice nursing, but likely won't be criminally charged. Um, I really think they should be criminally charged because they knew they bought fake degrees. They practice nursing without a license. And I think that this, again, needs to have criminal charges behind this. So, um, yeah, it says nearly 300 graduates from Siena and Sacred Heart took the practical nursing exam over the same period. Sacred Heart never had a pass rate below 40 percent. Uh, excuse me, a pass rate above 40 percent and Siena never hit above 60 percent. It's just. And these are private for profit schools. So uh, on average, 52.7% of students pass the uh, NCLEX exam, uh, bringing down what might otherwise be a better passing rate in Florida. So these private schools then are dropping the pass rates overall for the state for the legitimate schools. This is just really sad. And so this is why I'm bringing this, this information to you, to understand that, that it impacts not just those uh, nurses to have fraudulent licenses and the care that the patients are receiving, but it impacts overall and reflects poorly on uh, nursing and nursing education as a whole. All right, so let's move on to um, let's move let's move on to this last story before we move on to um, um, some more happier news. Okay, uh, so it, this says three individuals facing federal charges for participating in healthcare fraud scheme to sell fraudulent nursing degrees. And this is coming from the District of Maryland and a press release by the Justice Department. A criminal complaint has been filed against Patrick Nuwaku of Laurel, Maryland, Musa Bangura of Manassas, Virginia, and Johanna Napoleon of Wellington, Florida, with conspiracy to commit healthcare fraud, conspiracy to commit false statements relating to healthcare matters, and false statements to healthcare matters in connection with a scheme to produce and sell fraudulent nursing transcripts and diplomas. The criminal complaint was announced by acting U.S. General, excuse me, U.S. Attorney for the District of Maryland, Jonathan Lesnar, acting U.S. Uh, Attorney. Juan Antonio Gonzalez of Southern District of Florida, Special Agent in Charge Thomas so Sobosinski of the FBI, uh, Baltimore Field Audits, and Special Agent Charge in Charge Agent in Charge Elton Malone of the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General. So according to this. Um, this criminal complaint has uh, been issued. Um, the diploma from the nursing schools uh, too appears to be signed by Napoleon with a graduation uh, date of Jan June 20, 29, 2018. Uh, Nuwaku, Bangora, Napoleon and their conspirators allegedly sold illegitimate transcripts and degree degrees for between $6,000 and $18,000, which is a shame. So if you have more information, there is, they're, they're looking for uh, more information. And if you know of anybody that has a fraudulent degree, the FBI does have a hotline that you can set up and report these people. Okay, so again, let's look at some happier news. Um, let's go to this story, uh, Governor Youngkin removes regulatory burdens to increase opportunities for nurses' aides. This is from WSET out of uh, Richmond, Virginia. Governor Glenn Youngkin announced this week 
that the Virginia Board of Nursing is implementing changes to improve the quality of training, availability of training, and the hiring process of qualified nurse aides as, the, as in, uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, according to the Secretary of Health and Human Resources, John Little, I am grateful to the Board of Nursing for their strategic efforts to bring more people into the nursing profession, especially at a time when the demand for nurses is widespread. Rights widespread. Nurse aides are often on an entry port for entry point for careers in nursing, an important part of the profession. I happen to agree with that because this is one of the reasons why we had started our CNA training program as an entryway into the nursing profession. It, one, it gives you an opportunity to see what nurses do. It gives you those uh, initial skills that you'll need for nursing school, and it allows you a chance to uh, work with patients and get comfortable with that. And so what they're going to do, uh, they're going to allow nurses aid training to occur in a clinical setting outside of a nursing home facility, focusing on geriatric care, require only the program coordinator or primary instructor, but not both individuals to hold a license as an RN, remove requirements for geriatric care experience for RN and LPN instructors and instructor experience from two years uh, to one year and clarify roles and duties of instructional personnel and seek professionals from other health professions to supplement as primary instructors. So we'll see how that goes, but this is a way for them to get more um, nurses aid. Um, ensuring the appropriate and timely training is imperative for the 236 nurse aid programs across the Commonwealth with qualified and approved instructors. So we'll see what happens, but you know, um, Similarly, there were changes that were made due to COVID-19 um, that we had in the state of Indiana. So I was curious to see how this will play out. All right. <clears throat> uh, here's another uh, story uh, I found interesting. And we've been following uh, some of these stories of these nurses that have faced criminal charges uh, due to uh, medication errors and et cetera. So this is coming out of... Um, the Pause Valley Daily Democrat.com. Um, and this is guilty verdict comes in nurses trial. This is two different, completely different views of the same incident were on full display during a jury trial for a nurse accused of failing to give proper care to Pause Valley nursing home resident. In the end, an eight woman, four man jury found Amanda Dawn Davis, 35, guilty after hearing her account of the steps she took to treat a resident of Paul's Valley Care Center back on June of 2020, when while vastly different testimony from other nurses and aides at the local facility. The resident, a woman in her 90s, was believed to have fallen in the early morning hours suffering a gas to her forehead. On the other side was Davis, who testified that the woman hadn't fallen at all, but instead struck her head on a bar meant, meant to help her rise from her bed. She claims to have checked out the woman completely before assessing an, an ambulance was not needed to take her to the hospital for further treatment. When the three-day trial in a Gavin County District Courtroom ended Friday, jurors deliberated for about two hours before um, announcing a guilty verdict. The jury recommended no prison time for Davis, plus a $7,500 fine. Her actual sentencing will come later this month. Davis says she just wants to tell her story. Uh, when told by her own attorney, she shouldn't feel compelled to testify. So again, we're seeing more criminal actions against um, nurses, and this is concerning. Um, she says she found the resident in her room seated on the side of the bed as blood was running down the side of her face and a laceration on the left side of her forehead. Using saline to wipe the blood from the wound, David said she placed a small adhesive strips to stop the bleeding. Um, she said her, the, she reported that the resident said her neck, her head was sore. Um, she didn't say anything about neck pain. She said her vitals were good, her neurons were good, etc. So, Patchell uh, was among the witnesses who took the stand to testify the resident needed to be helped up off the floor, indicating she had fallen. This is Summer Patchell, one of the other nurses. Uh, Patchell described a significant fall as when it's not witnessed by someone else, the resident hits her head and there's bleeding. 
I got a report from Amanda that she had fallen and she hadn't sent her to the ER. I told she got up to get cookies and she hit her head. She said, the woman told her, Summer, I can't move my head. I can't move my head and I'm hurting so bad. There was dry blood all over her head, Patchell said, as Davis had applied small adhesives to the wound, but in what Patchell described as an improper way. She said Davis told her she had done a head to toe assessment of the resident. I don't know what she did. When you see this lady with a gash in her head and she's having trouble breathing, I didn't do anything but call EMS. The ambulance was called to the facility and the injured woman uh, was taken to be checked out at the hospital. Uh, Patro claimed there were no written notes from Davis on what action she took to treat the woman. Davis earlier testified her login in the facility's computer system was not working, so she couldn't chart her actions. She also claimed to update others about what had happened. So, yeah. Okay, so um, that's kind of what happened. Um, according to here, I don't have the original transcripts from the court trial or anything like that. But I wanted to bring that up because we're seeing more and more uh, nurses being prosecuted criminally for um, actions that they take. And I want us to be cognizant of that as nurses. All right. So let's get to some really good news. Yes. All right. So this is coming from Parkview Health and my alma mater, Taylor University, very excited, something I've wanted to see for a very long time. Parkview Health creates nursing program at Taylor University in Fort Wayne, Indiana. A long-awaited nursing program at Taylor University is becoming a reality for students from the help of Parkview Health. On Wednesday, a release explained at Taylor University and Parkview Health that they are expanding the university's healthcare professions. The two institutions are addressing the need for more nurses in Indiana. This will be the first nursing program in school history. Parkview will provide clinical site access for future Taylor nursing students at 19 locations, according to the release. At the latest, Taylor University uh, plans to have the program fully underway by fall of 2024. Currently, they're in the stages of hiring a dean for their nursing school. I think that is just wonderful. And I've often wondered why, um, because I went to Taylor University in Upland, uh, not the Fort Wayne campus. Uh, but I've often wondered why we didn't have a nursing program. I, I think that we missed missed it with that. So I'm very happy that they're finally doing this and they're forward thinking uh, because it is much needed. And so I'm excited about that. So woohoo, they're getting started with the, uh, I'm hoping it would be a, a BSN program and, and not just an ASN program. Not that I'm against ASN programs, but um, I think we need more BSN programs because I would like to see it grow. And so eventually maybe they'll have a doctoral program at uh, Taylor. Um, for their nursing. So I love it. I'm so happy about that. Um, as an alum, I'm, I'm happy. All right. And so now our last story for tonight is a nurse uh, making a difference. And who is it? Who is it? But all nurse practitioners. Woo! Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because according to nurse.org, uh, nurse practitioners have been named as the best healthcare job in 2023. Ooh. So for the second year in a row, nurse practitioners have earned the title of best healthcare job in America. The report is released annually by US News and World Reports. In addition, a registered nurses and certified registered nurse anesthetists also earn spots in the top 10. It's an exciting time to be in the nursing profession. So how did nurses, uh, nurse practitioners win the top spot? Well, let's see. What did they say? Sorry, I've got to get through some of this other stuff. Um, so these are the things that they looked at in the U.S. News and World Report, how they rank the jobs, median salary, so that middle of the road salary, unemployment rate, 10-year growth volume, 10-year growth percentage, future job prospects, stress level, and work-life balance. The U.S. News & World Report team compiles information from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, expert interviews, and literature research to give each profession a score of zero 
to 10, nursing professions are featured on several of the published lists, including the overall top 100 jobs, be, job, uh, jobs best healthcare jobs, and best STEM jobs. Woohoo! All right. So, congratulations to nurse practitioners everywhere uh, in America that we have topped the number one list. I'm very happy about that and excited. All right. So, that ends our news segment for today. I want to thank you for uh, tuning in um, for our show today. Um, just to end up some things, let's get into some announcements. Okay, so it is now uh, February 1st, and we have some great things that are happening, and I will update that in the show notes as we go along. Um, but we have some events coming up, and um, here we go. So one of our first events is we have our uh, rest and renewal a busy businesswoman love yourself valentine's day special that we will have so those of you that are local to the anderson indiana area or close enough to anderson and you want to come please join us for that event i'm so excited to have that that's our rest and renewal it's an in-person event we get together uh, uh, this is for ladies women to get together and we talk about um, the issues that we have in our business and the network and to get to know one another and support one another in business. So um, it's a great time. Um, and the uh, last time we had a wonderful time, we kind of went over our time and stayed a little extra because we just couldn't stop talking. It was wonderful. And that will be here at Baxter Professional Services. Then on Wednesday, February the 22nd at 6.30, this is online. It's free. You can register. It's on our Facebook page and also on Eventbrite and um, all events. You can register for our uh, will workshop, Give the Peace of Mind for Your Family, How to Get a Will and More. That will be coming up on Wednesday, February the 22nd at 6.30. And then we have other events that are coming up and this is for our nurse shark academy so we have um so you want to start your own nurse business an introductory course on saturday february the 11th at one o'clock uh, you can sign up for that on our uh nurse shark academy page or eventbrite or all events or you can go to our nurse shark academy website and sign up for that as well uh, that event will be coming up um, so those are the events that we have this far for the month of February. So I want to thank you all for being in attendance and watching. Please like and share our videos. Uh, we do want to have more people to watch and give them more information and give them great content. If you have any comments or suggestions or news stories that you want us to, to know, let us know. If you have a local event and you want us to promote your local event, let us know. And then lastly, if you know a nurse that's making a difference, give me a holler. Don't forget to also listen to our podcast, which will, uh, which comes out twice a month. And uh, those of you that are on LinkedIn and or on our um, on our website for the Nurse Shark Academy, our blog post will be coming out uh, later this evening for our next article. Um, and so those are the things that we have for you today. Thank you, and have a great week. And I will see you next week. Bye for now. <music>